Good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz coming to you from Los Angeles. And here are the stories we're watching tonight. Another mass shooting, this one in Louisville, Kentucky. At least four people are dead, nine others hurt. The governor there says he knew virtually everyone inside of the bank where it happened. This is awful. I have a very close friend that didn't make it today. And now that two different federal judges have issued rulings that both block and preserve access to an abortion bill, what happens next? And it's being called the most significant breach of U.S. secrets since the Edward Snowden leak in 2013. But did it all start in an argument over a video game? We've got the bizarre case of leaked classified documents that might have first popped up in a conversation about Minecraft. I think the American people need to know and deserve to know that we're taking this very, very seriously. And you know those two Tennessee lawmakers who were kicked out of office while calling for tougher gun reforms? Looks like they might win their seats right back into that chamber. And sea levels are rising in parts of the country much faster than scientists previously realized, putting places like Miami and New Orleans in even greater threat than they already faced. And today, a deadly mass shooting in Louisville, Kentucky, killed at least four people and left nine others hurt. This is mass shooting number 146 in the U.S. this year. That's 146 shootings in just 100 days. Now, police say a 25-year-old man armed with a rifle was behind this attack, which happened at the Old National Bank in downtown Louisville, where he worked. And investigators say the gunman was live streaming some of that shooting. Take a listen to someone who survived. We heard a click, and the lady next to me turned around and said, what the hell? And then he just started shooting. Uh, he had a long saw rifle, and he started, you hear the, 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 the shots just start firing. They were in the conference, back conference room. Whoever's next to me we got shot, and hit bloods on me from it. Now, the shooter's name was Connor Sturgeon. He was killed by police, but not before he killed four people. They are Joshua Barrick, Thomas Elliott, Juliana Farmer, and James Tutt. And they all worked at that bank. And it turns out that Kentucky's governor, Andy uh, Bashir, used that bank and knew a lot of the employees inside. We lost four children of God today, one of whom was one of my closest friends. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us now from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Maggie, how did the shooting start and, and how did the survivors make it out? Yeah, so, Gotti, as you know, this happened around 8.30 this morning. And basically, I mean, as you can imagine, it is haunting to hear the stories of the people who were inside that bank building, which is just behind us. You can kind of see the tall brick facade there. This is where that happened. And you can see a lot of the downtown is still closed off at this point. People telling us that when they first heard it, it didn't really click right away what was actually happening. They had to hear multiple gunshots, and they were walking by conference rooms where everybody was just kind of sitting, frozen, trying to compute what was going on. And then finally, they said everybody realized what indeed was going on. They were in the middle of America's now latest mass shooting, and they basically all took off running for the exits as fast as they could. Here's one man who we heard from earlier. His name is Craig Collins. This was his experience inside that building. Take a listen. Yeah, I was coming into work, getting on the elevator. I hear what I thought was gunfire. I was on the phone. I just walked out of the elevator and into the garage, and then I heard multiple shots again, and I uh, just ran outside, and then there were two police officers here on Preston. They said, run for cover, so I just ran exactly here in the which building. Again, people just in shock after going what they've been through. We also talked to a man who works at a medical device. He owns a medical device company across the street from that bank. And he says he was sitting at his desk 830 in the morning, getting ready to start his Monday when he saw all of this unfold front row seat in front of the shooting. He said he ducked behind a concrete and brick pillar and he watched as not one but two Louisville Metro police officers were shot by the gunman, one of whom is the critically injured officer who we've heard about, Nicholas Wilt. And he said he watched as Nicholas Wilt, Officer Wilt, was dragged away by fellow officers unresponsive. We now know he is, again, in critical condition at the local hospital. So just horrifying stories here on the ground. Gotti. Maggie, what a nightmare. I know this shooting was extremely personal to a lot of people, uh, including the governor here, right? 
Yeah, you heard that stunning connection, right? And the governor kind of disclosed pretty early in the day that he knew multiple people among the injured and among the dead, in particular, 63-year-old Thomas Elliott, who we can see on social media, went by Tommy. He was the senior vice president of that bank. And Governor Bashir was really blunt later in the day, saying that he said uh, Tommy, as he called him, helped him launch his law career. He said he helped me get elected governor. And he said he gave me advice on how to be a good dad. The governor getting emotional multiple times during the day and also multiple times thanking the first responders who helped all the victims and he says tried to help his friend. Take a listen. I want people to know that while today is a horrific act, I do believe that this is a safe community with officers doing their very best each and every day and that's what we saw here. And I want to thank them and all our other law enforcement officers responding and doing their best to try to save some of my friends and many others. And the governor adding there will be a time in his mind. He said there feels like there will be a time to talk about policy, but he asked everybody to just give this community at least one day to heal and to honor the victims, who, again, it includes his very close friend. Gotti. And Maggie, I know that so many people are disturbed by the fact that this was live streamed. How is that going to play into the investigation here? Yeah, so police first and foremost said that they uh, worked really hard and they say they believe that video has immediately been taken down, which was really important to them for obvious reasons. But they say as far as the investigation goes, they were first quick to credit the officers who were on scene within three minutes, who they say confronted the shooter right away. Again, two officers were shot in that gun battle. So we know this was at great risk to the officers. They confronted him. They say they killed the shooter. Now moving forward, it's going to be a lot about motive. They say the suspect who you've named, so we'll just stick with that one instance of saying his name. Again, they say he was an employee at Old National Bank. They also say two senior officials telling us that that man may have had, the suspect may have had, a history of mental health issues. But beyond that, authorities are being really tight-lipped at this point about the motive. They're also being tight-lipped about the weapon, only saying it was a rifle, not telling us what kind or how the suspect may have gotten may have gotten a hold of it. They also say they expect much more to come out in the coming days, which of course we know is kind of par for the course in these cases. We've been through a lot of these. Got it. NBC's Maggie Vespa, thanks so much. And Friday's abortion pill rulings have caused a storm of confusion because there wasn't just one ruling last week, but two. First, there was the ruling by the federal judge in Texas, and that would suspend the FDA's longtime approval of the abortion pill, Mifepristone. A short time later, a federal judge in Washington state issued another ruling on a separate case and ordered the FDA to preserve access to the same drug. The question now is, with these contradictory rulings, what's next? NBC's Dasha Burns has more. Tonight, the fallout from dueling court rulings. The future of the abortion pill is hanging in the balance after a Texas judge invalidated the FDA's approval of mifeprestone. The Department of Justice is now appealing that decision. What this ruling effectively is, is a backdoor ban on abortion. What options are available to the administration here? We've been waiting for the judge to, to uh, rule, and what we did is what we believe is the best strategy, which is to uh, appeal this decision immediately. Minutes after the Texas judge's decision on Friday night, a federal judge in Washington state with equal authority dropping a contradictory ruling, ordering the FDA to maintain access to the drug. It all sowed confusion nationwide and created a legal standoff. Used with another drug, mifeprestone is the most common method for terminating pregnancies in the U.S. It's been approved since 2000 and used safely more than 5 million times. But the plaintiffs in the Texas case, a group of anti-abortion doctors and medical organizations, allege the drug is dangerous and the FDA didn't follow proper protocol when approving it. I spoke with the group behind the lawsuit before the ruling. The result, if you win, is that abortion access will be significantly limited. Is that the goal of this lawsuit? No, the goal of this lawsuit is to protect American women and girls from dangerous chemical abortion drugs. It's, it's not, we are not seeking a, a nationwide abortion ban. We're Meanwhile, today, lawmakers in blue states vowed to do whatever necessary to protect reproductive rights. It harms patients, undermines medical expertise, and takes away freedom. Tonight, Mifeprestone remains legal as the battles rage on in the courts. Dasha Burns, NBC News.
Now, the White House has also been paying very close attention to last Friday's ruling. President Biden issuing a statement reiterating that his administration will fight the ruling. Today, Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra saying the administration will use every available resource to protect abortion rights. We feel very confident that ultimately we will prevail in court, that this one judge in one court in one state should not have the ability to undermine uh, safe and effective medicines that millions of Americans rely on. We're going to use every available resource to protect a woman's right to reproductive health care. And NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba joins me now. Monica, the administration is saying that they're going to fight this ruling, but exactly how? What, what kind of tools do they have to mount a challenge here? And they really expect this, Gotti, to be a long, drawn-out legal battle. And first, and what we saw almost immediately happen on Friday night, was the Department of Justice did issue notice of appeal. And now, since then, we've seen them take those extra steps to go toward that. Now, this was something that the White House and the president, they were bracing for this outcome for weeks. They knew that this was possibly going to happen. And they said that they were preparing for the worst-case scenario and that they were going to really want to fight this in court, and that is really the levers that they can use. They can have the DOJ go and even file an emergency appeal with the Supreme Court if they decide to go in that direction, if they feel like while they're still on another track trying to get the Texas order blocked by the Fifth Circuit, they can also go and use this if they feel like the Fifth Circuit is going to drag its feet and take too long. So that's one possibility. And at the same time, this is something really that Vice President Harris has taken on as the leading and most outspoken voice in the administration, and she called this a very dangerous precedent. And I think what you're going to continue to see the White House do here is essentially say, if something like this could happen for a drug that has been approved by the FDA for the last 22 years or so, what could it mean for other medication that has been deemed safe and effective? And so today, they really said, look, this could take a long time for the law to be settled here. It could take weeks. It could take months, even years, if it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, and they're the ones who end up having the final decision. But in the short term, they wanted to be very clear that this drug is still available for now, and they wanted to send that message to any woman who may need it in the coming days. Gotti. Is there any possibility that this spills over into Congress? I mean, is there even consensus enough in Congress right now to, to roll this back if it goes that route? So Democrats introduced a piece of legislation that they say would like to protect Mifepristone, but no, to answer your question plainly right now, in a Republican-led House, there is no real hope for a bipartisan solution to this. But because voters went to the polls in the midterms and really voted on the issue of abortion access, you can expect Democrats to keep bringing it up time and time again in hopes of getting something done possibly here. Gotti. Monica Alba, thanks so much. In the world of espionage and global conflict, the last thing you might think about is the video game Minecraft. There's this really bizarre case of top secret documents that were leaked to an online chat room about Minecraft. And the investigative site Bellingcat says those documents appeared to pop up during a random argument about the video game Minecraft and Ukraine on a Discord server. In fact, check this out. Those documents have been blurred, but Bellingcat says this is a screen grab of the conversation when someone said, here, have some leaked documents. Now, from there, it went to 4chan, Twitter, the Pentagon, and the Justice Department are now investigating how those highly classified documents ended up on social media. The leaked files revealed secret military information on Russia's war in Ukraine, and they are also shedding light on how America not only spies on its enemies, but its friends as well. NBC's Ken Delanian is here with more. Ken, can you walk us through how we got to this point? Because it looks like these first dropped on a small Discord server, and it had something to do with an argument over Minecraft and then Ukraine. Like, what's going on? Yeah, that's one of the very strange aspects of all this, Gotti, is that these documents apparently were on Discord for weeks, and no one noticed them uh, other than the people who were exchanging them and talking about them. Uh, certainly journalists didn't, and the U.S. government apparently didn't. They, they, they migrated from a smaller uh, channel to a larger one that, that was devoted to the game Minecraft. Uh, and then it was only on Friday that the mainstream media picked up on the fact that these highly, highly sensitive classified documents were circulating around, and then the cascade began. 
This is one of those tough ones because you see something like that and you're like, wait, no way is this true. It's on, it's on a Discord server about Minecraft and yet the geopolitical implications are huge. What, what exactly is revealed in these documents? So the dimensions of the damage here are twofold. One, the actual information in some of these documents is extremely sensitive, not only about the war in Ukraine, but about some of our allies and intelligence that has nothing to do with Ukraine. But just as an example, there's a detailed assessment of the weaknesses in Ukraine's air defenses and the fact that they are running out of ammunition. That could be enormously helpful to the Russians. So it's, it's a bad day for Ukraine and for the United States. There's also some embarrassing disclosures, some intel collection about Israel and about South Korea. So that's one aspect of it. The second is the, the sources and methods, the way the U.S. got this information. Some of that is disclosed in this reporting. They say it's from signals intelligence, which means communications intercepts and hacking. And when the Russians or other adversaries see that, it allows them to reverse engineer and to try to plug those leaks. And, and that means that intelligence collection goes away. So that, that could be the real impact of this. You know, these documents show that the U.S. had real success in penetrating the Russian government and the Russian military, but now the Russians know that and they know in part how the U.S. did that. So that's a bad day for the CIA and other spy agencies. Speak, speaking of intelligence, I mean, is there a digital trail that could show who is behind these leaks? So much of this is about how we're able to see uh, what's going on with adversaries, but do we know where these leaks might have come from? So that's the big question, right? As, you, as you've seen, they look like they're pictures of folded papers. So the implication is you know, they, it was stolen or leaked out as a paper document. But of course, that could be a head fake, right? This could have been hacked from a server somewhere and then printed out and made to look like it was paper. So th you know, that's exactly what the Justice Department is investigating right now. And then there are a number of possibilities. It could have been a hack. It could have been a leak from an insider. It could have even been an accident where somebody left a briefcase full of classified documents somewhere and someone grabbed it. So that's an open question right now. And the Pentagon said today that they can't even say for sure that the leak is plugged. In other words, that whoever d disclosed these documents no longer has access to classified information. So that's the top priority of the FBI right now is to try to figure out who that is and stop any further disclosures, Scotty. All coming from a Minecraft Discord server. Wild. Kendallania, thanks so much. You bet. And we have some breaking news out of Nashville tonight. A short time ago, ousted lawmaker Justin Jones was reinstated to his seat in Tennessee's House of Representatives. I believe and I pray that today marks a step toward real democracy in this state. I hope that we send a clear message to my colleagues or my former or soon-to-be colleagues um, in the legislature that we will not. And that was Jones in front of the Tennessee State Capitol. He marched there with a big group of protesters after this evening's decision was finalized. By the Constitution. By the Constitution. Of this state. Of this state. So And moments later, he was sworn back into the House on the steps of the Capitol, surrounded by a number of supporters. Last week, the House of Representatives kicked out those two Democrats, Justin Jones and Justin Pearson, for the way they protested for tougher gun laws inside of the chamber. But today, the Nashville Metropolitan Council voted to give Jones his seat back. And a different council will vote on whether Representative Pearson will get his seat back on Wednesday. Jones sent a very clear message to his colleagues that he was back when he took his name tag and he put it on his desk in the chamber. Take a look. And NBC correspondent Kathy Park joins us now from Nashville. Kathy, uh, so much happened today, a lot of yo-yoing. Uh, can you walk us through what you saw? Yeah, Gotti, um, certainly quite a, an eventful day here in Nashville. And earlier in the day, all eyes were on the Nashville Metro Council because they were going to hold that special meeting to reappoint Representative Justin Jones. And they did just that. And that process actually took a matter of minutes. But even before this vote took place, you saw hundreds of demonstrators, supporters of Jones outside of City Hall. Many of them actually made it inside the, the council chamber 
members, and they were holding signs that said, Justin, uh, no peace. So um, there were there was a lot of support, uh, support on so many different levels, and then those supporters actually walked from the City Hall to the State Capitol. We're in front of the State Capitol right now, and the, those demonstrations, it's kind of quiet right now. It's starting to die down, but clearly a, a sign of vindication. There was so much momentum building up to this moment. They feel like their voices were heard shortly after the reappointment today. And Kathy, I know this morning there were a lot of headlines about this concern that the House Speaker might not honor the reappointment, but, but ultimately the House did, right? Yeah, that was uh, definitely uh, a concern from folks because we didn't know how this would essentially play out. A lot of the, the council members, the lawmakers that we spoke with here in Nashville, they said in their time, their tenure here in Nashville, they have never had to go through anything like this. So they were kind of treading uncharted territory, and this was quite unprecedented. Uh, but ultimately, the House Speaker, Cameron Sexton, uh, honored the Tennessee Constitution and honored uh, the reappointment of Justin Jones when he walked in. Uh, we heard supporters chanting, welcome back, welcome home. Uh, but there really were no issues as, as he walked in. And we did uh, see him get sworn in outside of the state capitol. This was all kind of pre-planned. But like I said, there was a lot of things that was kind of that were kind of fluid throughout the day, Gotti. And Kathy, Representative Jones said something in the chamber that seemed to resonate with a lot of people. Let's take a quick listen. I want to thank you all, um, not for what you did, but for awakening the people of this state, particularly the young people. Thank you for re reminding us that the struggle for justice is fought and won in every generation. And Kathy, what do you think the younger generations make of, make of all this? Gotti, I think it's important to note um, that it's exactly two weeks of the day since the Covenant shooting here in Nashville, and that is really kind of the, the catalyst behind this movement because the Tennessee Three spoke out for tougher gun control measures here in Tennessee in the wake of that tragedy. Six people killed, three of those being young children. Um, I was out there for several days. I saw the grief in this community. I saw young people in tears when they were dropping off flowers and stuffed animals, uh, but it's turned into action. And, and those voices have been heard. I saw families out on the streets here in Nashville, people marching, marching for change, because they say enough is enough. So um, we have this reappointment. This is one step. But once again, all eyes will be on Memphis for the other House of Tennessee lawmaker, Justin Pearson. And they will have a similar process of having a special meeting. And then these two ousted lawmakers, uh, once they are reappointed, there will be a special election and, and a date will be set at a later time. Gotti? NBC's Kathy Park. Thanks so much. And still ahead on this hour, China's military says it is ready to fight. So how worried should we be about these drills around Taiwan, plus another day of violence in Israel? We've got a report from Tel Aviv, so stay tuned. Let's take a quick look around the world in 80 seconds. An avalanche in the French Alps on Sunday killed four people, a number that could climb as crews continue to search for survivors. A shocking video shows the sheer size and volume of that avalanche. One local French radio station puts its size at 3,200 feet long and 328 feet wide. And fears are growing about the safety of some 400 migrants who have been left adrift in the Mediterranean Sea. The ship's captain abandoned the vessel, leaving it at risk of capsizing in the shared search and rescue zone of Malta and Italy. According to a migrant charity group, several people on board require medical attention, including a child and a pregnant woman. And the Dalai Lama has apologized after a video surfaced in which he appears to show, uh, show him attempting to kiss a young boy on the lips and then asking the boy to suck his tongue. That incident took place at a public event on February 28th. Now, in Tibetan culture, sticking out one's tongue is a sign of respect or agreement, but the video, which has been making the rounds on social media, has made a lot of people really uncomfortable. A statement posted on the Dalai Lama's Twitter account reads in part, His Holiness wishes to apologize to the boy and his family, as well as his many friends across the world, for the hurt his words may have caused. It goes on to say that he was acting in an innocent and playful way. And that's today's Around the World in 80 Seconds. And turning now to the ongoing violence and unrest in Israel and the West Bank. Earlier today, Israeli forces carried out a raid on a refugee camp near Jericho, which Palestinian leaders say left a 15-year-old boy dead. 
NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman reports from Tel Aviv. Gadi, as Muslims celebrate the holiday of Ramadan and Jews celebrate Passover, there was fresh violence erupting today in the West Bank with Israeli forces killing a 15-year-old Palestinian boy. The Israeli military saying that they were conducting a raid on a refugee camp near Jericho to apprehend a terror suspect when those Israeli troops came under fire from riots that broke out uh, and began firing uh, live ammunition in response, apparently killing that 15 15-year-old. Uh, but just around that same time, there were thousands of Jewish settlers marching through the West Bank to an evacuated uh, illegal outpost in the West Bank. Uh, they were joined by some of the most prominent uh, ultra-nationalist ministers in Israel's government in a real show of how the far right here wants to see a more aggressive Israeli approach uh, within the West Bank. And there were clashes between those marchers uh, and the Palestinians in the area who uh, were throwing rocks at those marchers, uh, Israeli forces who were trying to secure that march, firing tear gas in response. And it comes at a time of very high tensions, not only in the West Bank, but in the broader region with uh, major uh, issues breaking out in Jerusalem at the Temple Mount, the known also as the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound uh, in the last several days, uh, and Israel exchanging fire with groups in Lebanon, uh, in Syria, as well as in the Gaza Strip. So really fighting on multiple fronts to the north, the east, and the west. And I spoke earlier today with Denny Setridovich, a former Israeli uh, military intelligence official, now at the International uh, Institute for National Security Studies, about what the situation is like right now. Here's what he told me. I think that uh, actually what we're seeing right now is uh, what we call the new era of war regarding Israel. I think in the past we had isolated wars, right? We could isolate the wars in Gaza, in Lebanon, but what we are facing right now is a multi-arena war. And Gadi, in a reminder of just how precarious the security situation is right now, if you remember Israel's defense minister, Gallant, who was fired by Prime Minister Netanyahu just about two weeks ago after he came out against Netanyahu's proposed judicial overhaul, tonight Prime Minister Netanyahu says he's unfiring that defense minister. He will keep him on the job, saying that despite their differences, it's important to keep him in that critical role uh, given the security situation on the ground here. Gadi? NBC's Josh Letterman, thanks so much. And China has completed its large-scale military exercises around the island of Taiwan, and the three days of drills included a massive show of force by Chinese military planes and vessels. Now, this comes on the heels of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's meeting with Taiwan's president in California. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby is in Taipei, Taiwan, with more. So every day of this three day long military exercise has brought a new headline today. It was a record breaking number of Chinese military aircraft, 91 in total, that flew near this island of Taiwan. Another 12 Chinese warships were also around the island. The idea here today was China was trying to simulate that they could cut off supplies. They could cut off any kind of routes in and out of this island by air and by sea. So what we saw yesterday again, a headline-making um, activity from China. They simulated strikes, missile strikes from air, land, and sea, with one of them even simulating a large attack on the capital city here in Taipei. So as I said, it's been three days of these military drills. They're in, in response to the series of high-level discussions that have occurred between U.S. and Taiwanese delegations, beginning with Kevin McCarthy, the House Speaker in California last week, with President Tsai, the, the, the president here in Taiwan. And then only hours later, a bipartisan delegation arrived here in Taiwan Taipei for several days of meetings that culminated with a meeting with President Tsai on Saturday. China angry about these meetings, saying that it violates the U.S. One China policy. Now, that says that the U.S. recognizes only one government for China in Beijing, but maintains these unofficial relations with, with Taiwan here. The discussions, these meetings between the U.S. and Taiwanese officials have had two main takeaways. One, showing a, a unified front between the two, the, the two places, between the U.S. and Taiwan. But also there has been a lot of discussion about the need to supply Taiwan with weapons and training of their military to help deter against any potential Chinese invasion. And then if, in fact, China were to, deci to, to decide 
to invade this island so that Taiwan would be able to defend. We, we're now learning, according to two U.S. officials, that the U.S. is strongly considering changing the way that they go, get weapons here to Taiwan by using the presidential drawdown authority. Courtney Kuby, thanks so much. And coming up, more than a dozen states are dealing with a bacteria and bacterial infections linked to eye drops. Dr. Sayal is here to separate fact from fiction. But first, you gotta see this. Here is a young moose, that's right, a moose casually sauntering into an emergency room in Alaska. Now, it couldn't be bothered by any of those onlookers in the back. It just wanted a snack. And after munching on a waiting room plant, that moose finally let security lead him right out of the sliding glass doors. Oh, so peaceful, only in Alaska. We'll be right back. And we've got some breaking news related to the COVID-19 pandemic. President Biden has signed a bill ending the national emergency declared at the start of the pandemic by then President Trump in March of 2020. Now, the White House previously said the president would unilaterally end the emergency declaration in May. It is now April. We're 30 minutes past the hour, so let's get you caught up in 30 seconds. Four people are dead and nine others are hurt after today's mass shooting at a bank in Louisville. All of those involved work there, including the 23-year-old shooter who was killed by police. And South Korea wants the U.S. to take, quote, appropriate measures once the investigation into those leaks, uh, intelligence documents that splashed all over social media is wrapped up. Those documents included sensitive information on the war in Ukraine and intel on allies like South Korea and Israel. And Tennessee State Representative Justin Jones has been reinstated to his seat following a vote by the Nashville Metropolitan Council. Jones is one of the two Tennessee lawmakers kicked out of the state's House of Representatives for protesting gun violence. Representative Justin Pearson was also expelled, and a vote is set for his reappointment on Wednesday. And a special grand jury is going to decide whether eight Ohio officers should be charged in Jalen Walker's shooting death. Now, the officers shot him almost four dozen times last year. Police say they were trying to pull him over after an alleged traffic violation, that they chased him, and that when he didn't stop, he fired a gunshot during that chase. NBC's Jesse Kirsch has more. Dottie, today began grand jury selection. This will be a special grand jury specifically reviewing only this case surrounding the circumstances of the death of 25-year-old Jalen Walker in June of last year. Officials have said that there were eight police officers involved in this shooting death and that Walker was shot 46 times, according to the medical examiner. There was unrest in this community in Akron, Ohio, in the aftermath of that shooting. And now after a more than nine month investigation, this grand jury will be reviewing the case and we could potentially see any or all of the officers involved be prosecuted and head to a trial. Seven of the nine grand jurors will have to find probable cause to issue an indictment. You can see behind me that this courthouse is fenced off. Some windows in this community are boarded up already and we have the city saying that it has created a demonstration zone where people will be able to protest in the street without being worried about traffic coming through an emphasis there on the hopes that protests in this community will remain peaceful. We expect from officials that the presentation by prosecutors will take roughly a week potentially. And we know that the potential evidence that could be presented to the grand jurors could include witness testimony, including from the police officers themselves, as well as other pieces of evidence, including possibly body worn camera footage. So this is playing out again, more than nine months after the shooting incident, something that this community is acutely aware of and something we will be watching closely in the days to come. Gotti. Jesse, thank you. Let's take a look now at some climate news that caught our attention today. It's a new segment that we call the temperature check. And global sea levels are on the rise, and it could spell disaster for us in a few decades. Now, rising sea levels are a direct consequence of human-caused climate change, and NASA says it's caused mainly by two factors. One, Ice sheets and glaciers are melting, which adds more water to the earth. And two, the fact that the volume of water increases as it gets warmer, known as thermal expansion. Now we're seeing that this is especially a problem around the Gulf of Mexico. Check this out. New Orleans Lake Pontchartrain, which feeds into the Gulf, has ridden, uh, risen eight inches since 2006, eight inches. 
and Louisiana is not the only Gulf state facing problems. Joining us now is Benjamin Kurtman. He is a professor of atmospheric sciences at the University of Miami's uh, Rosenthal uh, School of Marine, Atmospheric, and Earth Science. Professor, uh, just give it to us straight here. How big of an issue is this going to be in the coming decades? Oh, it's a big issue. Um, we're seeing. Um, very large increases in in uh, sea level around the globe. By the end of this century, uh, it's quite possible we would see three feet of sea level rise globally and uh, much higher rises locally. And I'm not sure if you've gotten a chance to check this out, but Miami-Dade County website has uh, this pretty cool uh, feature. It's got on the website, it says that sea levels are expected to rise by up to a foot and a half by 2040 compared to 2020. They've got this, and you're looking at it right there, this 3D mm -hmm. sea level rise viewer that shows how many buildings on the coast uh, would be affected by this. Uh, this is how many buildings you're seeing right there would be affected by a three foot rise in sea level. Uh, now. Peach is low risk, orange is moderate, red is high risk, and this is what six feet looks like. Uh, such a big difference there. What's the impact of rising sea levels? Is this just infrastructure? And I gotta ask, I mean, if somebody that lives out there in Miami, in, in Florida, have you played with this? Have you checked, is your house gonna be okay? <laughs> I'm very lucky. Uh, my house is at 15 feet. I happen to be on a coral ridge, but that's really not what's most important because, you know, I, I could be on an island that's uh, separated from sea level rise, but if I have to get in a canoe to go grocery shopping, that's a big deal. So we do need to really solve this problem as a community. We need to figure out how we're going to live with more water, uh, how we're going to redirect that water, how we're going to harden our infrastructure for living with much more water. And and like I said, by the end of the end of the century, three feet is uh, a definite possibility and even more. Is it inevitable? It is. Uh, we've committed to uh, a certain amount of sea level rise, even if even if we you know, magically stopped emitting CO2 today, we've committed to at least another 30, maybe 40 years of continued warming, which would be associated with continued ice melt, those glaciers, continued uh, thermal expansion of the ocean. And locally in Miami and in the Gulf of Mexico, changes in ocean circulation that can further uh, exacerbate the sea level rise problem. Professor, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. And eye drops are supposed to give us needed relief, right? So imagine the horror when people found out that the eye drops they use uh, were giving them a bacterial infection instead. And now the CDC is saying that it's linked to recalled eye drops that have caused almost 70 infections across 16 states. And the agency says that the bacteria has never been seen in the United States up until last year. Now, experts are pretty concerned because this bug has evolved in a way that is resistant to nearly all available treatments. Some of those infected have lost their vision, lost an eye, and three people have even died. Joining us now to talk about this is NBC's Dr. Akshay Sayal. Uh, Dr. Sayal, the products were recalled, so are they all off the shelf? Is this threat over? Good evening, Gaudi. Yeah, the, thanks to a lot of media attention around this, I think a lot of people are aware about the risk for eye drops, but the threat isn't really over yet, Gaudi, and that's because this bacteria, unfortunately, can continue to spread. We saw reports of, of a Connecticut nursing home where people who had never used this eye drop had, had evidence of bacteria on their skin. Um, so while, you know, while we may stop to see, we may not see as many cases linked to eye drops going forward, what we're really worried about is this bacteria going to continue to spread? And Gaudi, I, I know you mentioned this, but just to reiterate, the reason people are so concerned you know, this isn't something that if you have an infection, you go to a doctor's office, you get a Z pack, and you, you go home and you're fine. This is a pretty drug resistant bacteri bacteria. Pseudomonas on its own is pretty drug resistant. And then we have an even more resistant form of that pseudomonas, um, potentially needing really, really powerful antibiotics through an IV. So, you know, that's the reason we're, we're all very concerned about this. What are the signs that people should be looking for to see if they're infected? So when we talk about eye infections, the thing you really want to look for is you, you can have sort of red, green discharge, you can have itchiness, you can have pain. Um, but the issue here, God, is that it's not just limited to the eye. Those cases you mentioned where the patients had died, unfortunately, many of them may have become septic, meaning that the bacteria spread through the rest of their bloodstream and caused a sort of shock-like state. 
So, you know, you want to watch for that discharge. You want to watch for the eye pain, something stuck in your eye. Maybe, you know, these bright lights may be bothering you. Um, but it's important. If you, had a, if you have signs of a urine infection, if you have signs of a pneumonia or a lung infection, and you've used these eye drops, uh, you, you want to mention that to your doctor because that could change the bacteria that's ultimately responsible for those other infections. So it's not just the eye here we want to watch for. So we were watching for the eye drops, and you just said that uh, it could be spreading outside of just the eye drops, and there were some, some medical facilities. H how does it spread? I mean, are we talking about touch on a hand? Is this something that could uh, spread on surfaces? Uh, how would somebody else get infected? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. And contrast that to something like COVID or the flu, where we worry about, you know, spread in the air. Uh, with something like pseudomonas, we worry about touching contaminated surfaces, uh, specifically in the hospital, if you've been in the ICU, if you've had a breathing tube down your throat. Um, and those with weak immune systems, really those are the ones we're watching for, because those who are healthy, if they come into contact with this bacteria, nothing may happen. It may just live on their skin and maybe what we call a colonizer. Uh, but with those with weak immune system, maybe those fighting cancer, autoimmune disease, um, whatever it is, those are the ones we're really worried here. And, and that's why we need to all kind of group together now. Dr. Sayal, we really appreciate the warning. Thanks so much. Anytime. And up next, the future of everything. You can't believe everything an AI chatbot tells you, but can you sue it for defamation? A mayor in Australia is lawyering up. And here's some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Tory Lanez's sentencing for shooting Grammy-winning rapper Megan Thee Stallion has been pushed back again and is, as his legal team tries to get him a new trial. Lanez was convicted on multiple counts in December and faces a maximum sentence of over 22 years in prison. Texas Governor Greg Abbott says he wants to pardon a man who killed a Black Lives Matter protester back in 2020. On Friday, Daniel Perry was convicted of murder for fatally shooting a man who approached his car while carrying an AK-47 which is legal to do in the state. Perry claims he acted in self-defense. One of former President Donald Trump's lawyers, James Trusty, says there are no more classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. This comes after reports stated that Trump's legal team has turned over more documents as well as a laptop to investigators. And on NBC's Meet the Press, Trusty denied those claims. And I can tell you, the, the leak about what happened with this additional document or several documents that were found in the thumb drive is absurd. Now, the mother of a six-year-old boy who shot his teacher earlier this year will, will face charges. Today, a grand jury indicted her for child neglect and recklessly leaving a firearm to endanger a child. This comes a week after Abigail Werner, the teacher who was shot, filed a lawsuit against school administrators for failing to act on warnings that the child had a gun. And Spanish golfer John Rahm took home his first Masters championship this weekend in Augusta, Georgia. He is now the fourth Spaniard to win the legendary green jacket. And when it comes to artificial intelligence, you got the good, you got the bad, and you got the absolutely terrifying. Take a look at this. What you're looking at might be the future of dentistry on display at a trade show last month. Are you brave enough to sit in that chair? And for your other trusty doctors, AI chat box, uh, bots are also making a play for them as well. A Harvard doctor says the latest version of ChatGPT easily passed the U.S. medical licensing exam. It can even diagnose rare conditions in seconds and was able to correctly diagnose a super rare genetic disorder involving a real-life case to help a newborn baby. But for all of the promising headlines, uh, we know that these chatbots are far from perfect. And if they get something wrong, can you sue artificial intelligence? Well, a mayor in Australia said he plans to sue OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, because it made up a story about him being jailed for bribery. His lawyers are demanding a retraction from the company. ChatGPT also wrongly accused a law professor of sexual assault. It even cited a Washington Post article that was never written. In response, the company said that factual accuracy is a significant focus and that they are making progress. Now, here to discuss this is Hani Farid. He is a professor of computer science at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, professor, thanks so much for joining us. There is no legal precedent here, right? I mean, how would this even play out from a legal perspective? Uh, could, could they put the chat GPT uh, like computer on the stand and ask it questions? Uh, I don't think so. I agree with you. There's no real precedent here. And I think we are going to start 
creating new law. And one of the big laws that is going to be pushed here is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act hmm. that has historically protected, uh, say, an open AI from me saying something defamatory. But when it's the company's own technology that says something defamatory, it's not clear that they get protection from this law that is allowed for this very open and wild, wild west of the internet. Uh, this is a very big question, but, is, but does, does an AI model know that it's lying? Does it know that it's saying yeah. something that is inaccurate? It's a great question. And this particular model, these so-called large language models, it does not. What you have to understand about the chat GPTs and these models is that they are very sophisticated autocompletes. They start with a sentence and they ask, what is the most likely next word? And then the next word and the next word. So think about that Gmail thing that you get where it suggests finishing your sentence, but a sophisticated version of that. It is not fact checking. It doesn't know about Wikipedia. It doesn't know about going to a professor's website and trying to fact check things. And that is problematic. And it's additionally problematic because when you get the responses from ChatGPT, they're authoritative with references that are completely fabricated. And so this is a very dangerous tool. And I, and I, I reject this idea that OpenAI says, well, we're going to make it better. I, I think they are beta testing a faulty product on the public to the tune of billions of users. And they're going to have to deal with the consequences of that. And speaking of that beta testing, I mean, again, I'm trying to picture this in court and them trying to explain where this deep neural network has somehow yeah. connected this dot with this dot. And yet for a judge and jury, you, you can't even show when the code does that, right? A lot of this is, is still very nebulous, very cloudy, right? It's, it's true, and it's also, it's also stochastic. It means it changes every time. If I type exactly the same prompt over and over into ChatGPT, I will get different answers. And so it's extremely unpredictable. These models have billions, hundreds of billions of parameters that are very hard to understand. But I would contend that at the end of the day, the company that developed and deployed this has responsibility. They have to take responsibility for the harm that they know or knew or should have known that their technology is creating. And for people that are starting to use some of these chatbots, it, it, for me, it seems to be becoming the new Google. You have a question, yeah. instead of going to Google where you can see uh, where the hyperlinks take you and then go to those sites and check out the references, you're just yeah. getting a big chunk of information. And there, if you ask for the sources, it'll tell you. But yeah. it, it seems like there's a big difference between Google taking you to those places and chat GPT, which just regurgitates a large amount of text at you. Is that, is that problematic? It, it is, and you should stop. <laughs> stop using chat GPT for search. It is not a factual system. It is not a place to get information. There are interesting and useful and exciting, as you said at the top of this piece, applications of chat GPT. Searching for information about a person, an event, uh, anything is not what it is designed to do today. Maybe tomorrow it will be, but right now, we have to live within the guardrails of what the technology is capable of doing and what it is not. And if, if we, and I think though the burden shouldn't be on us. The company has to put those guardrails in place place for us. You say stop to the people that are using it, but do you see people yeah. stopping and do you see no. those companies putting up those guardrails? Uh, no and no. Uh, the fact is that we are moving very fast uh, and you can see what happened here. OpenAI released ChatGPT. Uh, Microsoft thought, hey, we can topple Google. So they started putting it into Bing. Google panicked and released their own version. Facebook panicked and they're releasing their version. And now everybody is running very, very fast to deploy technology that we don't fully understand. We would never tolerate this in the physical world. We would never tolerate somebody releasing a physical product into the hands of consumers. But for some reason, we tolerate it in the technology sector. And part of that reason is that the law has not caught up. We don't know how to think about these things. And while we're still trying to deal with the mess of the last 20 years of social media and the internet, we're racing into the next two decades not fully understanding how the legal system should deal with this. And we have got to move a little bit faster on the regulatory side to keep up with a very, very fast AI space. Professor Hani Farid, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And up next, what you need to know about tomorrow, plus who knew a haircut could be so heartwarming? We're gonna introduce you to a Cincinnati barber bringing joy to families with special needs.
And time now for some of the big stories to watch out for for tomorrow. It's students at Nashville's Covenant School are heading back to a different school for classes just two weeks after a shooter killed three children and three adults. President Biden is headed to Ireland and Northern Ireland for the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, which ended three decades of violence in that region. And FEMA is hosting a town hall in Rolling Fork, Mississippi, after a tornado absolutely destroyed that small town. So keep an eye on all those stories tomorrow. Before we go, one Cincinnati barber is dedicating one day every single month to give free haircuts to kids with special needs. And Joe Fryer has this story, so take a look. The slang term for a haircut is getting your ears lower. You want to say hi to everybody? Hi. Hi. But this one will get your spirits raised. And up. That's seven-year-old Ellison Eubanks laughing in the barber chair, a sight his mom, Julie, never thought she'd see. You see, for Ellison, who has Down syndrome, haircuts were once on par with root canals. They were sensory overload. I felt like we would leave every appointment kind of, you know, traumatized and he would have even more of a negative view of a haircut than he did before. Then they met Vernon Jackson. You did an awesome job, man. I'm so proud of you. Who just seemed to have the right touch. It's something about Vernon's energy is really cool. Ellison just gravitated towards him right away and he treated him like a human being, like any other client. A couple years ago, Vernon created the Gifted event. Using money donated by the community, he gives free haircuts to kids with special needs, to those who may otherwise feel marginalized. I'm someone like, no, I see you, and I want to address you as you may have seen. I'm here with you through the process. During his second haircut with Vernon in January, Ellison, who's known as a bit of a class clown, suddenly decided to play a game. Stop and go, and go, bringing sheer joy. And go. Video of this moment has been watched on TikTok more than three million times. The people that are viewing this video are being healed from their perspective and their stigma and having a little more patience with the children. A valuable <laughs> lesson that, thanks to Vernon and Ellison, and is getting the green light. You can say go. It's like their BFF now, you know, like he loves going there. He walks in and he gives him a hug and he knows to sit in the chair and he knows that it's a safe place. Hey, we finished. <laughs> Joe Fryer, NBC News. How about that for the best of us? That does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We're going to see you tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.